Look at there, we're going live. Live. Right here. There's a lake behind us. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Palm Boss, hanging out up here in the north of St. Joe, Texas with the West family. You can see Jacob, but right over his shoulder is his dad, Bobby, and Grandma and Grandpa are sitting over there in a UTV watching this, shaking their heads, wondering what in the world is going on out here. I see, uh, look at there, there's Michael Gray checking in. He's probably sitting in the bulldozer in Tennessee somewhere. There's Andy Myers. Danny Mack is uh, sipping something in San Antonio looking at his pond right there. Yep, look at there. And, and uh, Chris and Carrie Lusk, I know we're related. We have to be. We got the same last name. So anyway, here we go. On location in, uh, are we in Montag County? Montag County. We're in Montag County, hanging out. There's Michael Cooper, Steve Lewis. Look at there. There's Steve Lewis. He's a fisheries biologist over there in Hot Springs, Arkansas. He raises Florida bass over there. There's Barry Gann. Michael K. Cooper, Mike Cooper, works on our boats and equipment at Lake Texoma. So he's a, a boat mechanic working on the marinas on the west end of the lake. Lindsay West, holy cow, who's that? <laughs> that is my sister-in-law. All right, check her out. She's checking in. So um, this kind of got a cool story lined up. Oh, by the way, you know the drill. Hey, look at here. Palm Balls Magazine, 35 bucks a year. I used to tell everybody it's cheaper than a Friday night date, but it's not anymore. But it lasts a year, <laughs> and this virus won't. Look at there. If you'll put hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the, in the comment section, click like and share this to your timeline, you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a mug that what? Keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. <laughs> That's it. So, um, very, very cool story for you out here. I see Josie checking in. Hey, Josie, good to see you. You'll meet Josie one of these days. They've got some property down... Um, Oh, in Central Texas, and she and her husband, her husband works put setting up warehouses and things, so they're not always spending time together, except every Wednesday night, they have a date night to watch this show. <laughs> I don't get that. So anyway, hey, I'm hanging out with the West family here, and over our shoulders, you can see their new lake, which is probably how half full? Half full, we're about 13 feet from full pool. Okay, and, and you've got some water out there now that's how deep? The deepest part right now is about 18 feet. So right now, part of the reason we're here is we're waiting on the fish truck. Now we're, we're hoping, which I don't know if it's going to happen or not, we're hoping that the fish truck gets here because we're going to stock their first bait fish. So we've, well, I'm going to let them tell you the story here in a minute, but uh, we've got copper nose bluegill coming from Alabama. We've got uh, native bluegills coming. We've got fathead minnows. We've got two sizes of red ear sunfish. I didn't even tell you this, but... Well, the fish hatchery called this morning. We had a chance to get some really nice size four inch red ear that are big enough to spawn. Nice. So I just traded dollar amounts to get bigger red ear along with some of the small ones. So we're gonna do that. Sometimes you make some decisions kind of on the fly. So, you know, I was just, I was talking to, to Bobby and Jacob about the ranch and the ranch has been in the family. It, it, it's called West Haven Ranch. And it's been in the family since the late 1800s. And back then it was a cotton farm and they farmed cotton all the way up until they started farming oil. So they didn't need, back then they didn't need any any cotton, but the oil played out, starting probably, I guess the oil was going from what, the 30s until? About the 70s, 80s. Okay, and then the wells played out and the, the ranch partly laid fallow and kind of grew up. And so then uh, Bobby and Jacob and the brothers and family and Grandma and Grandpa decided they revive it and start spending more time out here. And you guys have had it for about what thirty years, I guess, that you've been that you've been working on it, playing with it, taking care of it. And so uh, one of the things they decided they wanted to do was to build a lake. And you get to see it right over here. And you know, we'll we'll take the phone off. We broadcast on a phone. That's a secret. <laughs> Not anymore, right? And so some of the features they've got. You know, I mean, what's 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 over your shoulder right here? Those fenders off of a truck or something? Those are actually corners to automatic car washes. So what business are you in? Car wash business. <laughs> they build car washes. Twin Oaks Distributing. Twin distributing. I'm sorry. Twin. Say it again. Twin Distributing. Twin Distributing. There you go. So if you want to build a car wash, this is who you want to talk to. So I'm going to see if I can find this. You go ahead and I'll tell you what, Jacob and Bobby in a minute, you, you lean in here too. 
and you guys talk about how you started thinking about building the lake and what you, you know, how you made the decisions. And one of the really unique things here is these guys built this lake themselves. They didn't hire it done. They didn't go pay somebody. They bought the equipment because they use heavy equipment in their in their business anyway. And then, you know, part of the time when, when they've got employees that weren't working on that project, they'd come work on this project. So it's taken a while, but I'm gonna let them tell you the story. So tell us a little bit about the story about the lake. Well, we've been dreaming about doing something like this for probably about 10 years. And about seven years ago, we finally pulled the trigger on making it a reality, starting to make it a reality. So we bought a dozer and started working it, getting tips from Mike Otto and yourself. And uh, seven years later, here we are. We've made several changes along the way. Um, it, it, it's just, it's much better than what we anticipated in the beginning. I'm glad it took seven years. It's been a fun project and we learned so much more by it taking a while to build versus getting it done in a year. So you uh, you started when you were in high school and you've got grandchildren now. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that bad. Seven, <laughs> seven years from the time you started, but and you're glad it took seven years because why? What, what are some of the reasons that you're glad it took seven years? Education. So in other words, what you're saying is, is and one of, my, one of my pet peeves is talking to a landowner and one of the first stories he says around the campfire when we first meet is, man, I wish I'd have done this different or I wish I'd have done that different. So you guys took your time, you went along, and of course this isn't the only project you've got going. Right. You know, and so your learning curve sounds like it was pretty steep, but every time you got to a certain point, you were able to implement that here. What, just for the folks watching this show, what are some of the things that you can look back on and just kind of one of those palm to forehead moments where you said, man, I'm really glad we stepped back to take a look. What, what are some of those things? Uh, the biggest one that you can't see in the photo, but on um, this side of the lake is actually an island that's um, probably about three quarters of an acre. We had about four acres of land that was going to be less than three foot deep underwater. Okay. And we were very concerned about it looking bad with the lake levels rising and falling, or most importantly, being able to fish it and it being overgrown with vegetation. So we learned that from you. Oh, thank you. And <laughs> one of one of the one of the things we decided was to take all that land and push it up towards the middle of the pond and we actually created an island that's about three quarters of an acre. And so now we got rid of the four well, acres of shallow water. So you got so it was to get rid of that four acres of shallow water that would have been vegetated and would have been hard to fish and vegetation breaks loose and floats across the lake so the give and take was you got the depth so you gave up a little bit of surface area to get the depth and not have to have the management headache later on right i got it look at there there's tim stewart you guys know tim he's checking in he's uh i think he's in new jersey right now he's got his beehives up there kelly duffy with helena he's our go-to aquatic vegetation guy and there's nobody I know that knows more about it than Kelly does. Bob Wusher, and I can't tell who else is here. They've got a little bit of a glare here. Dennis Smith, Eric Avery, Mike DeMint, checking in from Memphis. Duffy's in Houston. Tracy Smith, checking in. Dennis Smith is from Pittsburgh. Just bought a subscription. I saw where you did that. I saw that online when the order came in. Steve Henry's checking in. John Funk. Matt Singley, let's see, there's Josie. Frank James, Frank is a, Frank, I thought about you Monday. I drove over to Belzoni, Mississippi and back on Monday, which if you say it fast, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I came back through Shreveport area on I-20, I don't know, probably about 7.30 or 8, and I was more interested in going home than stopping. So uh, I thought about you as I was passing through. All right, so let's see here. Um, Chuck Brinkman says, sure does look nice there, which, it is. It's raining there. He's uh, Michael Gray's in the excavator, not a bulldozer. Oh, so <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> All right. So, so you decided about ten years ago you had a dream we're going to build a lake, and you 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 thought about it, planned it for three years before you started getting to it, and then the process that you went through. Uh, how did you know where to start? And 
You know, a better question in a minute is how'd you know when you were done? Because we had that conversation a lot. I think you're done. No, we're not. Well, I, you know, you kind of are done. Well, no, we want to. We need to move this around. We we heard this. You told us that. So now we're going to do this and add that. So you added three years to the project. Thank oh you. my gosh! Woo wee! <laughs> we better stock some fish that grow fast. <laughs> make up for some of that time. So tell tell us a little bit about the process that you went through as you guys just started uh, doing the work. Well, we we knew what we the idea we had the idea but we didn't know how we just needed to get educated so we actually went to the palm boss conference the number two palm boss conference and that was before we ever started got to learn in a little bit and uh, figured out who we needed to talk to and uh, get some more education on what we need to do what we need to buy how the process works and we just started doing it and yeah, Mike Otto out and did did a couple of test holes and checking the dirt to make sure we had the right soils to do it. And we actually moved the dam. The pond grew in size because of uh, <laughs> testing the, the dirt. Okay, so in other words, you brought Mike Otto out here and he dug some test holes with what? What kind of machine? Traco. So he brought a Traco out here. Did you have one? Uh, at the time, we did not. So he brought a Traco. Otto brought a Traco out here. They started digging around, finding some test holes to see just exactly what kind of dirt they had. And because of those test holes, you moved the dam site. That's correct. And you did that because you wanted to get the dam site sitting on better soil or because of the proximity of the soil you wanted to build the dam with? I um, believe it was sitting on better soil. Okay, so you wanted to, so you wanted to place the dam on top of better soil. So Otto's concern was if you build a dam here, you're going to have to excavate too much Correct. to get down to build the core trench to build a foundation on which to put the dam. Is that is that a pretty fair statement? That's it. Yes, sir. Okay. And so then uh, how far do you have to go to, to get the clay to put in the dam? Not very far at all. So uh, well, the core trench was 18 feet deep. The core trench was 18 feet deep, which is... Below existing. Okay, so when you look at natural ground level, go down 18 feet. Now, what'd you do with that dirt? Put it on the back side of the dam. Okay, so you pushed it back out of the way, and then when you started building the dam up with clay and you started getting ready to build your backside slope, you used, they used that dirt that came out of the core trench, which the backside slope dirt's gotta come from somewhere, so you really moved it just a short distance. Correct. So that made good sense to do that, okay? Let's see here, look at their... Uh, Pamela Sims says, hi, son-in-law. <laughs> hi. Hi, Pamela Sims. All right. William Burgess, we got a question, looks like. Let's handle this real quick. I have a question about filament algae. Been treating three years with q Plus and Clipper. Helps a little, but one and a half acre pond looks nasty from Louisiana. I've been receiving pond balls three years and enjoy the magazine. All right, Mr. Burgess. Um, double check the identification of that plant. Take a picture of it and text it to me or send it to me in an email or uh, on a Facebook message or something. Matter of fact, connect up with Kelly Duffy. Kelly's watching this show. And let's, first of all, make sure that we know what the plant is. Because sometimes, sometimes it's confusing with some of the different kinds of plants. So, job one is to identify the plant. And let's get Kelly involved in this discussion. And he can help you figure out what to do with it. All right, so there's uh, Steve Lewis checking in again. He put in the hashtag Palm Boss. Yeah, put in hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like, share to your timeline. Eligible for a drawing for a mug that what? Keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. Knows how to keep hot things hot. We don't know how it does it, but it knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. I've actually had hot things in this mug and cold not at the same time. And a Palm Boss hat. Look at there. There's the logo. All right, so now let's see. Chrissy offered Chapel. Chapel, I just stocked 750 copper nose bluegill and red ear sunfish. Do they migrate to shallow areas or do they go deep? We've only seen two since we put them in. Well, and there's Tim Jackson with Purina checking in. Speaking of Purina, we love Purina. You guys just bought three Texas hunter feeder, four Texas hunter feeders, and you you're, you got two of them set up and ready. And you're feeding what kind of feed? We just bought four bags of uh, MVP today. So Purina's Aquamax MVP to feed the bluegill and the fathead minnows. So to answer the question, uh, those fish, once they get acclimated to the lake, they're going to go where they are safe. 
Now, they don't think about that. That's an instinct. So if you've got some structure, some cover, or some plants, they're going to go to that and get in it. If you want to see them, then you probably ought to feed them. You know, and so um, odds are that they're fine. There's Bridget West. Oh, hi, honey. <laughs> Where's she hanging out? She's at home with the kiddos. Taking care of babies. Wishing she could be here. That's what she does. Look at there. She just shared it and said, hey, watch my husband on Pond Boss. <laughs> That's good. Share it. All right. Uh, Chrissy says we feed them every day. So they're not, are they, if they're not coming to the fish food, just be patient. Because the fur here's, and this is going to happen in this lake. Uh, we got a load of fish coming. We were hoping they'd be here during the show. Not sure they will. You know, and if they, if they do, then we'll show them during the show. But here's what we'll do. When the fish get here, if the show is finished, I'll go live again and we'll climb up on the truck and nose around in the fish and let you guys see what it's like to uh, stock a brand new lake. Now, how big is this lake? At full pool, it will be 14 acres. All right, and so we're stocking it, but it's only maybe a third to a half full Correct. in terms of volume. So the decision we made was to stock it a little bit larger than this, anticipating spring rains. So we're stocking it as though it's about uh, 10 acres. And we'll take you through that stocking process and the thought process here in a minute. So, uh, Chrissy, here's what I want to tell you. I don't know how long those fish have been in there, but sometimes it takes them a little time to really start finding that fish food. And once they find it, there'll be a few that find it. Then they'll go get their buddies, and they'll, they'll attract each other just by the way they behave. And more fish will start coming. If you don't see fish coming to your fish food, now feed Aquamax MVP. It's a high-protein feed, nine different pellet sizes, that's a really excellent feed to be feeding your fish. And uh, it smells good to them. It's, it's fish meal based. So it's a good, strong fish food. And if you're feeding by hand, anybody listening, feed them at the same place, same time, every day, except when you're in church. You know, forget Sunday. Don't worry about that. But if you'll feed them five times a week or six times a week and you're consistent, same place, same time, which these feeders will do that, uh, it won't take them long to find that fish food. So, look at there. Tim Stewart's asking questions already. He's already, he said, are you feeding them? I've and, tested the feeders today, but until the fish get in, yeah. not really any point in feeding them. Yeah, problem. no, not yet. Yeah, I think he was kind of talking to, to Chrissy about hers. Yep, she said they feed them every day. Tim Stewart said, do you, he's asking, do you see him hitting the feed? Okay, here we go. I'm going to back out of that conversation. <laughs> Jerry Seibert from Oregon. We're doing good, buddy. Good to see you. All right, so Chrissy says, we had a good population already that feed voraciously. Not sure if they're in with them. It's been one week. Uh, when you stock brand new fish into an existing population of fish, sometimes it takes those young fish a little bit longer to jump into the fracas. So they might be standing their ground back. Now, of course, if you're feeding MVP, about 20% of that fish food slowly sinks through the water column. And those fish, until until they figure out their spot in the pecking order, yes, I said pecking order, they'll stay down low and they'll feed low. So they won't come up and start hitting until they match up in size with those fish that are feeding now. Okay, here we go. Frank James has got one for you. Jacob, two questions. First, how much does your lake level vary over the year? Second, have you limed it? Uh, first question, we have no idea. Our anticipation is that it's going to fluctuate six eight feet maybe at the most that's that's probably exaggerated okay as big as their watershed is they're going to lose some water to evaporation uh in late july august and september so I, I can't imagine this lake dropping more than three to four feet through the course of a summer but then all they need is one little training rainstorm that happens with pop-up showers in this part of the planet each summer so i could i could see that i could see that happen you know, where the water lake would drop two feet and then go right back up eight inches in an overnight rain. Mm -hmm. uh, they had their water chemistry checked. The water chemistry is excellent. pH is 6.6. .6. Alkalinity is drum roll, 89 parts per million, which is perfect. That's perfect. If alkalinity is too high, then fertility doesn't work. If it's too low, then fertility doesn't work. So they've got the best situation they could even think about. Now, they riprap the dam, which... Yeah, you can see that. We're, the dam is what's right behind us. And all that white right there is limestone rocks about the size of softballs to volleyballs probably, or maybe a little bigger, some of it. And that's all limestone that they put there on purpose. Okay, let's see here. 
Chrissy says that makes sense. I hope the turtles, the turtles are not eating your fish. If, if, if your fish get eaten by a turtle, they deserve it. They're way faster than a turtle. Look at there. There's Dick Tabbert checking in from Swanton, Ohio. We got Jordan Stout. Um, Mr. Dillard checking in from over there. He's a fisheries biologist over uh, in, I think, in Georgia. I think they call him Rick, but online he's Josephus. Let's see. Robin Adams checking in. Let's see. William Henry. What's that? That is some kind of waterfowl, either duck or... I, I don't know. I haven't got close enough to it, but it's <laughs> it's living in those uh, trees that are being flooded back there, and it's uh, constantly talking. I hope you can hear that. That's pretty cool. Rick Best. Rick Best is a retired sheriff's deputy from uh, Laurenburg, North Carolina. Good to see him on here. All right. Now then, so there's our question so far. Yep. Um, what are the turtles eating? You know what? Turtles will eat anything from vegetation to uh if, if they can catch a fish they'll eat it but they make their living mostly off of vegetation they'll cut off roots i've watched them i've actually planted lily pads and come back the next day and the pads floating because the stinking turtle cut it off you know so they'll root around and they'll eat i tell you what they will eat they'll eat fish food so out here when these feeders are going off they'll start seeing some turtles and they just show up Dion myers from tipton indiana so now let's talk a little bit more till we get some more questions uh so now let's fast forward seven years. You figured out that you needed to, to recite the dam, which made the lake end up being bigger. And your watershed's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, how much rain have you gotten to, to get this much water in it? This much water uh, was one rain. It was about two and a half, three inches over a 12 hour period. What we basically dammed up here was a flash flood creek. So it's- it, 1200 acres watershed. Watershed's 1,200 acres for a lake that's going to be about 14 acres when it's full. So do the math on that. Two spillways. Okay, that's that. Was, <laughs> you knew where I was going to go. All right. So part of their part of their engineering. Did you get any engineering help, or is this stuff you figured out over time? Stuff we figured out. All right. And the the one of the spillways is really uh, the primary spillway is really interesting to me because they're they're diverting water in a way where they're using a levee. That's that duck. <laughs> I've never heard a duck like that before. Well, there's got to be somebody that knows about birds that's going to chime in here in a minute and laugh at us because we don't know what that is. And so uh, uh, with, a, with a terrace that guides the water around and away from the dam to dump it back in the creek probably a quarter of a mile below the dam by design. And it's and that the, the pitch of that spillway is so slight that I thought that it was a cove when I first saw it, you know, because it's levied up high and it, it's, it's, it's not even a 2% grade. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. It's not even a 2% grade, but it's downhill enough that the water, the water will flow off of it. But then as it gets farther away from the dam, then it, and it's really wide. It's what a hundred yards wide or something, right? About 150, yards. 150 yard wide spillway is the primary spillway. Oh, but no, they needed another one. So tell us about the second spillway. So that main spillway, uh, is on one side, it's on the west side of the dam. The secondary is on the east side. And that spillway will, it's actually eight inches, 10 inches higher than the primary. And it diverts water the, the exact same way. It sends water down uh, way past the valve, past the back side of the dam. We just don't want anything washing out the back side of the dam. When you say valve, what does that mean? We've got a 12 inch pipe going from the deepest part in the lake out through the dam coming out the other side so if you want to drain some water off okay so if you want to drain some water off the lake then you can do that yes sir okay all right and so then so you've designed your primary spillway 150 yards wide where water can only flow maximum eight inches deep before the secondary spillway picks up the water and sends it off the other end of the dam that's correct so what what will happen is this lake can't have much more than uh, uh impounded much more than 10 inches of 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 water above full pool right and it's going to go off that spillway really okay so and eight inches i mean that probably not going to happen very often no that's one of those you know, 50 year 100 year floods which we have about every three or four years exactly <laughs> there you go say hi to debbie lusk 
Hi, Debbie. <laughs> We're missing you, honey. Okay, so now, um, so now it, 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 and really that the seven years that it took to plant it and build it, that wasn't just building the dam. Right. Tell us about, I mean, this looks like a dadgum amusement park out here. here before we end the broadcast, we'll take the phone, the camera, <laughs> and start spinning it around and showing you some of the stuff that's going on. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> it's a, I got to figure out what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got to have some bird person tell us what that is. All right, so now, as you start to thinking about the inside of the lake, and Bobby, why don't you slide over here too, son? Yeah. Come on. Here, slide on. Let's, let's get Bobby in on this so you can, you can see the voice behind the head or face or something. All right, so Bobby, you guys were thinking about what you wanted out of the lake and so what what were your primary goals when you built the lake as you were going through the process of figuring out what to do how to build the dam well with our first uh time we went up to uh the pond bar seminar we we uh learned got to figure out what our goals are and then we decided that our goals were um uh, uh, what's that noise coyotes can you guys hear the coyotes <laughs> So we decided we wanted uh, bass, maybe some double digit bass, but I wanted my grandkids to be able to catch a lot of fish. And then we wanted a place to swim and have a good time. All right, so this is a family fun place where they can have family reunions or come out for the weekend. And it's how far from the house, an hour and a half? Yes. It's about an hour and a half from the house. And you, you've heard a little bit about the history of the place. And so, um, yeah, Chupacabra, that's it. Yeah, Scott. Scott McClure, they've got a lot of chupacabras up there in Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay, and so the goals were, let's let's build a lake that can house a fun fishery to grow fish for the grandkids to catch, but if a good angler shows up and taps into a double-digit fish, you're okay with that too. Correct. Which that kind of helps you decide the uh, stocking rates and things like that as well. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the habitat. So, I mean, I look around, I see all kinds of stuff that used to belong in a car wash. I see a bunch of barrels with pipes sticking through them. I see a bunch of moss back fishing tractors out there. We just started uh, finding things in our scrapyard of old car washers we bring home. And uh, just, hey, that'll work if we do this. And we just start piling stuff together. And so what you figured out was how to space it to where fish could get in it. And like like these corners back here, as the water covers that up, fathead men has loved to stick their eggs on the underneath sides of firm objects, especially plastic. And even after the fathead men has disappeared, three or four years or two years, or however long it takes, that's a great place for paraphyton to grow, folks. Paraphyton is part of what helps cleanse the water. So that's good substrate that not only gonna serve a purpose early on, it's gonna serve a purpose long term. And that's the kind of stuff you guys were thinking about when you were putting Correct. this stuff together. All that from going to the seminars. Pond Boss Conferences. We've had seven of those. And you said you went to the second one? Mm -hmm. Yes, we've that... been to all of them, but the first one. Well, the second one was in Arlington. And that was, shoot, that was about 13 years ago or so. Wow. We need to have one out here. <laughs> hey, wait, we're doing that right now. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's see here. Tracy Smith wants to know what kind of bird that is. Well, we do too. Tom Davis checking in from Ohio. Chris Ketchum, I'm a good angler. Can I tap a 10-pounder out of there? I'll tell you what, when your beard goes from turning red to gray, you will, because it's going to take about six or seven years to grow a double-digit bass out here. Debbie says they can't hear you guys as good as they can, because that's because I talk really loud. So I uh, might need to talk a little louder, all right? Jack Hamilton checking in from Indiana. Okay, so... Um, Bobby, as you guys, and Jacob, you, you chime in there too. Y'all might speak up a little bit or scoot up closer yeah. where you can hear a little bit, but where they can hear a little bit better. So as you were designing your habitat, you you put all kinds of neat things. I mean, I'm looking at a peninsula that's rip-wrapped that looks like it's probably 15 feet vertically tall. Is it that tall over yes. here? Yes. Okay. 15 to 18 feet, and okay. we put rip-wrap on the sides so it wouldn't wash away, and then we put uh, rocks all down the sides, large rocks, three-footers and larger, and uh, for fish habitat on that. 
Were those rocks on site, or did yeah, you bring them in? We dug them up here. Okay, so when they were building the dam, they were coming across things that the, I guess you stashed them out of the way, and yes. then so then you came in later and positioned everything. Correct. All right, and I see some standing dead timber or some things. Looks like you've pushed over, you know, in the and and part of the riprap is their soils in this part of the country, especially soils above the clay, are considered dispersible. And I learned that word from Mike Otto when he built a lake about 25 miles west of here, 30 miles west of here. And part of that lake, there was one layer of a lift that, that they built in it where it didn't compact right and that soil dispersed. So in other words, water started running through it and pushed that dirt and made it move and it moved out of the way. So part of the reason to have riprap, even though it costs a pretty good chunk of change, is so you don't have to come back in in 15 years I hear a finner going off. off. <laughs> look I at that. For seven. Oh, look at the fish eat. Oh, he turned around and looked. <laughs> oh, there's another feeder going off. Woohoo! We'll come. We'll come back over here in a couple of years and do that, and you can see the feed, fish blowing up on the feed. Yep, those feeders are working. All right, and so you, uh, you guys probably spent five of those years figuring out the kind of habitat that you right. wanted. Yeah, we got. Uh, we built about twenty. Uh, we used 30 gallon soap drums from the car wash and some old piping that we had laying around for years and kind of made our own fish habitat running through the through the drums and uh, put uh, let it stick out about four foot on each side all right and so that and then I see that you that you bundled those let's see it is seven o'clock now in a minute in a minute we will take the the camera and we'll start spinning it around so you can start seeing some of these features that we're talking about there's Matt Rail checking in. I love Matt Rail. Matt's a fisher's biologist that helped a big company in Florida create a lake division, and now he's got his own business up in Indiana. So Matt's an outstanding guy. As a matter of fact, he's been, I think, to every one of the Palm Boss conferences except maybe one himself. So you guys have bumped into Matt. Uh, matter of fact, there's Jack Hamilton from Indiana right there when Matt Rail from Indiana checked in. You guys, if you don't know each other, here's an introduction. <laughs> All right, so now, as you were thinking about your habitat, bringing that all together, some of the revelations that you got that we've talked about in the past is you, you really didn't understand how to tie all this stuff together and make it a community. So now you've, you've figured that out, and you've got what are the different kind of features that you've got. I mean, I, I'm looking out there. I see, I see this peninsula that drops off riprap. Then it, there's a flat area that looks like kind of an island an underwater island that you've got some habitat on top of, which is adjacent to a peninsula with a big, beautiful post oak tree on it, and then some coves. Talk a little bit about some of those features that you guys did. Uh, one of the one of the neat things that you've always discussed is you got to have a place to loaf and a place once that baby's hatched to go hide. The, if you can make a fish last 45 days, you get a whole lot more flesh out of that than you do grow the bass bigger so we did in one cove as the elevation was going up we did a layer about eight foot wide of gravel for spawning beds and then up a notch we did a layer of uh, topsoil so that we're promoting the growth of uh, water uh, aquatic plants aquatic plants you bet and then up from there we did another uh, run of gravel and we did that stair stepping up so there's always a level of spawning and always a level of aquatic plant. okay so here here's your take home point they're they're planning for the lake to draw down you know frank james asked the question how much is it going to draw down well there uh, this area of texas as a matter of fact you know what if you want to look at it on google earth go to 2290 ivins road i-v-i-n-s saint joe s-a-i-n-t joe there's a story behind that instead of S.T. Joe. It's S-A-I-N-T Joe, Texas. And you can see a picture right now. Well, don't do it now because you'll blow off the show. But go to Matt, go to um, uh, Google Earth and look at it. You can see exactly what we're talking about because they've got a recent photograph up there. All right. Let's see. Uh, Willie Howell's checking in. Matt Rail's bragging about Bob. That's cool. Matt Hines is checking in. Okay, so basically, so here, let me tell you the points that I just heard these guys say is they know that if they've got good spawning habitat adjacent to some areas where they're gonna promote aquatic plants to grow where they want them, 
adjacent to another level of spawning beds that they're going to help ensure that they get good recruitment young of the year bluegills because when a baby bluegill is hatched if you guys have watched this show much you've heard me say this before but when a baby fish is hatched about 12,000 of them weigh a pound and I think Steve Lewis counted those fish help me out Steve I think maybe you did all right so um, we just got a text from the truck driver he's uh, the fish truck driver will be here in about 30 or 45 minutes so what we'll do is we'll, we'll plan some time to see fish. So we're gonna go over time today if this phone holds out, excuse me, camera, if it holds out and things click. If it doesn't, then I'll come right back on live and we'll start looking at fish. But what what I'm hearing here is that, that they're thinking about a bunch of things people don't think about. You know, the, the baby fish, 12,000 per pound when they're hatched, but if they can keep them alive for 45 days, a baby bluegill, they're 30 per pound that becomes a significant nugget of food for these double digit bass that they want to grow. So what they've done is they've designed into the basin of this lake at different vertical levels, the different elements of habitat that fish need to be able to thrive, spawn, loaf, congregate. Uh, they've even built some corridors. It's pretty cool because you can see some travel paths where they've left the creek channel intact with some standing timber along the creek channel for a structure that fish Fish can't think. They don't have the ability to reason like we do. They act on instinct and conditioning. And when, when these fish get stocked in here, a, a percentage of them are gonna go thrive and do great. Some are gonna be average. Some of them ain't gonna make the cut, but before long, they're gonna be spawning. And when they do, they're gonna build a food chain and it's gonna be pretty dead gum cool. Billy Wolf's checking in. Good to see Billy Wolf from Whitesboro, Texas. Billy's got a pretty nice sized lake over north of Whitesboro off of Bones Chapel Road area over that way. Stephen Gordon, who are you using to stock your tanks? We're about an hour away from y'all. Using American Sport Fish Hatchery. If you want some information about them, send me a private message. Uh, otherwise, on Pond Boss, we have a resource guide. Go to the resource guide at pondboss.com and you can see all the suppliers that are there. So uh, we've got a number. And now another thing we do, we vet our advertisers. I'm real picky about that. We don't, somebody, we don't want to promote somebody or advertise somebody that we don't know. And so we spend time getting to know them. But these fish are coming from American Sport Fish Hatchery uh, because they ordered, they wanted some pure strain copper nose bluegill coming out of Alabama. So that's what we did. So here in a minute, we're going to talk about that. Ron Ardwan says, where's the wine? <laughs> I got to drive after this or there'd be some wine, I promise. that They wouldn't be doing it, but I would. <laughs> All right, so there's Trey Carpenter. Trey Carpenter is a wildlife biologist that manages lakes down around the Burnett area in central Texas. Stephen Gordon. All right, so that answered Stephen's question. Let me see here. We got some more stuff going on here, and then I want to tackle some more stuff. Okay, somebody already clicked like. That's got to be Danny Mack. I didn't have wine for you, Bob, because I didn't have those really cool <laughs> cups that Ron had. <laughs> he did. He had some goblets. <laughs> I started to shoplift one, but they but there's a history behind them, so there's a story. No, that was that was really fun. Okay, let's see how we got here. Uh, Trey Carpenter, Bluegill Rock. Yes, they do. And and the there what what we decided to do here was mix up the gene pool a little bit because we know copper nose do well, especially in deeper lakes like this along the Red River. We're not far from the Red River. Uh, if I had Nolan Ryan's arm, I could probably throw a rock. No, probably not. But we're not far from the Red River or the Oklahoma border. So uh, this thing is um, uh, subject to some pretty cold temperatures in the winter for Texas. And copper nose bluegill don't like that. But So we decided we kind of hedge our bets for two reasons. We wanted the copper nose strain because we know those things get huge and they're beautiful. And we put some uh, northern or some native strains of bluegill in here as well because we know that those things can get just as big or bigger in the right circumstances. And with as much habitat as there is out here, that's pretty cool. Let's see here. Uh, Justin Shanks checking in from the uh, from the left coast. He says, "Hey Bob, nice looking pond lake behind you." Yeah, it is. We're gonna look more. We're gonna look more at it here in a minute. So now let's go. So now we built the dam. Seven years. You you. And you kept making habitat changes, and you you give me credit or blame <laughs> for three years of that or stuff. Because every time I'd come over here, every time we'd talk, I'd throw some things out there. Then they'd come back out, and one of the, my favorite things about these guys is they think these things through. 
They don't get in a hurry, and then when they get ready to pull the trigger, it's done. We're sitting in a remote part of the planet, and we got Wi-Fi. Internet bridge. I don't know. I made it happen. Yes, he did. So here we are. I think there's one bar on my phone. Shout out to my IT guy, Jason. Thank you very much for your help. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So... Justin wanted to add to this. He says, my bluegill already started spawning, but the herons are really hurting them. Makes me mad. Um, you know what you might do to try? Get a uh, piece of rebar or a pole and tie a couple of pie pans to it on a string to where they clatter. See if that makes a difference. I just made that up. It might work. So <laughs> okay, so now, as you, as you th thought through the habitat, as I recall, one thing led to another. And so you'd, you'd get to a certain level, and then we talk, and that would make you think of something else. And now, I mean, we're, I promise we're going to look around because it's pretty cool. So tell us about that thought process, and, and how did you know when to quit? We, we had you out, and you said, <laughs> you said I, we asked what next, and you said, put, plug it. <laughs> Shut the valve. <laughs> Let some water come in. So they did. Do they plan to add Threadfin Shad? Yes, th Threadfin Shad will be stocked in here, if not next year, the year after. I think I just heard a turkey gobble. Yeah. Did you hear a turkey gobble? All right, so if not, if not next year, and that call will be made based on the size of the, the, the bass at that point. Now, here's the logic behind that. Threadfin shad's primary job in a lake like this is to promote the growth of bass from 10 to 14 inches. That's what threadfin shad do, to push them on up to 16 or 17 inches. So if we don't have bass that have grown into that 10 to 12 to 14 inch slot after the first year, enough of them, then the threadfin shad wouldn't be a good investment because Three out of four winters here, they'll make it, but that fourth winter, the water temperature gets down below 42 degrees, they'll die. So we'll 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 watch how these fish grow and then we'll make that call later. Let's see, there's something. How many acres does pond need to be able to stock thread fins? I, I'm gonna tell you, if a pond is three acres or bigger, thread fin can work, and it also depends on where the lake is. So that's the way I see that. Good stuff, guys. Keep it up, says Matt Rail. All right, we will. So now, the lake's built, habitat's there, and now we got water in it. It was time to start thinking about what fish to stock. So, and folks, I'm telling you, there's as many ways to stock a lake as what my mama used to say is Carter has liver pills. There's a lot of different ways. You know, I, 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 I've told this story before. I had a guy that was almost 80 years old. He said, son, I don't want to stock those fingerlings. I don't want to wait for them to grow up. He says, I don't, I've, I've stopped buying green bananas and I'm not sure I'll be here when they get ripe. So I don't want to wait. I want to go, you know, and that guy wrote a great big check and we stocked adult fish as though the lake had been there for five years. Then I've had the other guys that are in their early twenties with three year old kid, baby girl, and says, I want her to catch fish when she's 10. So we had seven years. He said, I got 500 bucks. So somewhere between those two is where most people sit. So based on your goals of wanting to grow some trophy bass and, the grandkids to catch some fish and the other goals how did kind of what was your thought process on how to stock this thing take that one well we just uh going to the pond boss conferences and listening to everything you said and and so we just come to the conclusion of uh uh the um uh, to two thousand per acre okay because you want to speed up the growth rates of your bass. That's so you correct. want to build your field. Okay, so here's here's the numbers here, folks, is, you know, the American Fishery Society recommends stocking 500 to 1,000 bluegill per acre, and they recommend stocking five pounds of fathead minnows per acre. So as we started thinking about that, their timeline, they wanted to get the fish growing a little quicker than that. So we're stocking a total of 2,000 sunfish per, per acre, which would be 1,500 uh, bluegills, half copper nose, half natives, along with 500 red ear sunfish per acre. And that gives us 2,000 sunfish per acre. They're putting in uh, 20 pounds of fathead minnows per acre. Now, the, the big deal about that, now we're stocking it as though it's 10 acres. And 
the decision we made was it's not quite 10 now, but we think it will be by the end of May with two or three more rain events. And then if it grow, if it gets bigger, then we can always add more. But that's enough fish to really get it started to where we can get to the point we can stock the bass in it sooner rather than later. So the, the goal is, is to stock the fish, let the bluegill grow a little bit. They'll start spawning when they're two and a half inches long. So it won't be long before we're seeing baby bluegills. There's all kinds of substrate for fathead minnows to stick their eggs. There's more plastic in this thing than there is blowing around on Walmart's parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and so they've got all kinds of substrate for fatheads to spawn on. So their stocking rates were, de were designed to help grow some trophy bass quicker by bumping up the numbers of forage fish, giving them a chance to become established and then later we'll do the bass. And later, later is gonna be contingent on how well we see reproduction, how fast the minnows spawn. You know, here we are at the end of April, so we've got another probably six or eight weeks of perfect weather to see how much fish can really become established. And there's, a, there's an outside possibility we could put the bass in in June. And maybe we will, I don't know. We'll make that decision later on as we go, right? Okay, so that's that's how we came up with the uh, the stocking ideas. There's Frank Jones. He sells those twin trawler boats. Have you guys seen those no. twin trawler boats? You need to see. Look up, and they will go Google twin trawler boats. It's 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 a it's a heavy duty, um, plastic encapsulated boat that two guys as big as me can get in, and it won't even wobble. There's two seats, and you drive it with your feet. It's got two trolling motors underneath it, and you drive it with pedals. You know, and I mean, it spins on a dime. It's pretty cool. You guys need to check it out. Hey, Frank, here's a lead. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tim asked if we're going to stock bass next spring. We're going to let the lake tell us when it's ready. Now, here's the, now here's, here's what I want you guys to know. Resist the temptation to stock bass too soon. If you remember, it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass to gain one pound. So we really, 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 I mean, it's taken them seven years to get this far, 10 years since they thought about it. Why do we want to rush it? So we're going to let the food chain really establish, build itself. The only reason I would feel compelled to stock the bass sooner is if we come to the point where we see that some other fish have infiltrated the lake and we want to get ahead of them. I don't think that's going to happen here. So we're going to let the food chain build, and then we'll come in behind it with some bass and let those fingerling bass, we're going to start with fingerlings, so we don't lose any growth time. <clears throat> we're going to put in babies and let them get going and see how well they do. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking up, I'm kind of thinking up uh, in the middle of June would be a good time because I really think this lake will come up another foot or two between now and then. Let's see here. Chris Ketchum, I got a pond I'm beefing up to be a good crappie pond. There's existing crappies, black, white, and a few magnolia crappies. That's the ones with the stripe down their faces. Um, Bluegill and bass, trying to pull out bass when I catch them. Any bait you recommend to put in? for a good food source and a bluegill. Yeah, bluegill are okay, good luck. Crappie, I'm not a big fan of crappie in small waters, but I've seen people make it work. So Ron says, I'm thinking here in the deep south, I may go 1,200 to 1,000 bluegill per acre due to no winters and excessive bluegill spawn. Your thoughts? Um, it depends on your timing that you want to do for your bass. If you don't mind waiting a year to stock bass, that's a good number, because that way you can create, let, let the food chain develop itself over the span of a year. Part of what we wanted to do here is get the bass in way before a year so they can get a jump start growing and during good season. All right, let's see. There's Chris Steelman. He's a fisheries biologist. Uh, let's see here. Frank Jones, you got the details right. Yes, sir. All right, we'll see. Okay, so now um, it's 718. We're waiting on the fish truck. So now um, let's talk a little bit more. Let's kind of start tying a bow around this. You built it like you wanted. Now it's filling up. We're going to get the bait fish going. Uh, one of the management strategies, you're going to feed the fish. And you're just going to feed them supplementally because we know that with as much ground as this lake is covered, that it's going to grow its own food chain. Now, oh, here's a question I've got for you. Uh, one of the things I heard Jacob say a while ago is they put topsoil where they want it. Does that mean you strip topsoil in shallow areas where you don't want plants to grow? Absolutely. Okay, so they got rid of the topsoil so that in areas that they were a little suspect, where they don't want plants to necessarily grow, so they strip the topsoil off of that to minimize the risk of having plants grow in areas that they don't want. So that was a pretty, that was a real smart thing to do. 
Okay, so now, what, uh, any other comments before we start moving this camera around a little bit? Um, one of the other things to go back to goals is uh, two pound bluegill. Ooh! And when you're growing to manage a large bass, you know, to get to the double digit, is that not a side effect? And something that kind of can go with that is large bluegill? Absolutely. And so that is definitely, I want Bruce to come down here and catch a two pound bluegill. <laughs> Are you checking in? Bruce, Bruce hasn't checked in yet. He usually checks in. Huh, okay. Let's see here. Uh, Scott Angelico says, what can I do to get shiners to reproduce in my pond? They spawn on grass. So if you don't have any if you don't have any aquatic plants like bushy pondweed or American pondweed, you know, one of the pondweeds around the edge, go buy some square bales of hay and do it now because the shiners are eggy now. So go get some square bales of hay, break them up into little chunks and throw them around the edge of the pond where the wind can kind of keep them swept up against the shore and they'll spawn at daylight if they're still eggy holy cow look at there tracy smith just said the very same thing i said chad sepulvedo how many acres is that pond going to be when it's at full pool stage 14 acres right now it's probably seven or eight and we're stocking it as though it's 10 and we're still in the rainy season okay so at 721 i'm going to take this broadcast mechanism here and we're going to take it off here and let's see here if I can see the questions, I'll answer them. But, all right, so Jacob, look with me here. You guys look with me. Now, there's the dam behind us. Mm -hmm. So as we spin around, what's all that stuff right there? Those are uh, softener tanks out of car washes cut in half, tied together to create uh, places where fathead binnas can put their eggs and uh, hiding place and structures for bluegill. Got it. All right, and so now we're kind of, oh, there's their internet connection there. There's how you get internet to the pond. But there's a drop off a bluff right behind us. Tell us about that. Uh, that's actually where we got the majority of the clay okay. for the core of the dam. And a side effect of that is that cliff. And I think it's great habitat for largemouth bass. All right, so what you basically did was instead of, instead of cutting that off to where you'd have a slope, you left that there because that's going to be flooded, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right, so how deep is the water going to be on top of that cliff? About a foot deep. Okay, so if you're walking along in foot deep water and you slip off a cliff, you're going to fall how deep? Uh, pretty deep there. <laughs> I'd put a, hey, put a ladder over there, boys. <laughs> okay, so now behind us, we've got those um, corners that you've got. Now, what's right behind it? What's that green stuff standing up there? Those are voluntary... Um, willow trees that grew and we are debating on whether to cut those off at water level right now but um i think they'll be completely underwater by the time this thing fills up all the way okay now here's how to make that decision those willow trees will live for about 18 months to two years once they're flooded one of the things about willows is they have a root stimulant where they'll even on the limbs if they're out of the water they'll kick out roots off the limb of the willow tree and start sucking water up into the willow trees. Let's see, Latham Pugh says, with all the flooded timber we have, where we're talking about shad to bring the bass out into open water, yeah, that can sure happen. Once the threadfin shad spawn and they're out in open water, you're going to see topwater action just like you see, see white bass or sand bass or stripers out in the middle of a big lake. So, yeah, that'll happen. Okay, so now we're going to kind of get into the sun a little bit. What all we got going on back here? Can you tell? Back there is the uh, peninsula that we built. Uh, it actually has a well on it, and we're going to tap into that well to um, have kind of a cascade waterfall going down the front of those big rocks that we made at the end of it. Okay. So, okay. That's very cool. We've got okay. a windmill to put on it. Yeah, okay. You're going to put a windmill on the well? Yeah. Okay. That's neat. Okay. So now we're going to keep going around here, and there's that big... There's that big, there's grandma and grandpa watching the show. <laughs> and then there's that big peninsula over there. And all, you can't really tell it, but off the end of the peninsula, there is, what's that thing sticking up? Is that, that, a, is that a tree you cut off? That's a tree we cut off. The top of it is at water level, spillway level. So you recommended to us to put something on that, to identify that in some way. So we bought, on the way home after our council meeting last time out here, a pelican off the side of the road. Oh, my. And so that has now been dubbed Pe Pelican Island. Pelican Island. That's pretty cool. All right. And I'm starting to hear some frogs. I can hear some uh, 
tree frogs out there. All right, so let's see, what else can we see? So you guys have pretty well gotten a good idea of this part of the lake. Hope you can hear the frogs. They're just now starting to chirp. See, Todd, Todd. Are y'all gonna stock any catfish? No. That's our next pond on the other side of the property. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that. Um, now that's part of their strategy. We started, since, since the primary goals are to uh, to have largemouth bass and bluegill, we know that channel catfish, once they get to be two or three pounds a piece, will be competitive. They'll, they'll compete with those target fish. And with a lake so big, if you've got a 14-acre you know, lake and you've got even 20 catfish per acre, you know, being able to catch them, you're not, you're not going to catch, you're not going to catch very many, but if you stock bigger numbers, then you're going to be compelled to catch some. And there's a percentage that will never buy a hook, you know? So trying to make that decision about catfish, the reason to have them is because you love to catch catfish or you want some fish to eat. So I think that the gist out here was you wanted a few catfish from time to time so you could have a fish fry, right? Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do when they get to it, probably by the time Jacob's got gray hair is build a catfish pond. <laughs> So, so they'll build a catfish pond up on the hill up here and stock catfish. And that way, if they want a few catfish, they can go get them out of a half acre pond. And, uh, we have talked about building several hatchery ponds. We didn't talk about that. So you guys talk about, you're thinking about building some hatchery ponds up here to grow bluegills, things like that, because you think at some point that the, that people have told you, myself included, that one of the limiting factors is bait fish later. Correct. So... Tell us your thought process about that. Year two or three, we, we're thinking we need to start supplementing our uh, uh, bluegills. So we'll grow them and uh, we'll build three or four hatchery ponds, and then we can always have something going. We'll do some freshwater shrimp. Uh, we'll do some uh, trout in the fall and try to uh, give the bass plenty of things to eat. So there you go. And see, one of the cool things about that is they have the equipment and the know-how and some employees that can do that when they're not building car washes. So, and that's part of how they did this, you know, cause that's part of why it took seven years is because they wanted to maximize the use of their resources as they were thinking about how to build the lake. And that's a fair statement, isn't it? Correct. Okay, so there we go. All right, so we're knocking on the door at 7.30. We got about three minutes. And I think what we're gonna do is I think we're gonna finish this part of the show up. And then when the fish truck gets here and gets situated, especially if it's still light, which it should be. It should be here within about 15 or 20 minutes. We'll go live again and show you guys how how a... Uh... <laughs> that bird again. How many do you have on there? Is that 83? Yeah, yeah, you're pretty popular, dude. Normally where it's 50 like, or 60. Yeah, yeah. Several people just dropped off, but listen. That's fantastic. Okay, we got to know what that bird is. Any bird folks out there? I see Joseph Reynolds just checked in. Todd Todd's watching. Okay, so there's the answer on the catfish. So let's see here at 728. Uh, you guys, I tell you what, if this information doesn't help you, I don't know what does. This has really been a great interview out here on the Lake Bank with the Wests doing what they do. And I want to thank you guys for taking the time. And, and Jacob's, I mean, he he ran power how far? 1,500, 1,200 feet. When I said, like three days ago, I said, hey, you know, the fish truck's going to be there Wednesday. Why don't we do the show on the shores of the lake and he said okay and so he ran electricity and of course he, he kind of blew it off to me by saying well we needed electricity down here anyway so here we are we got electricity and we've got internet and he did it with the help of who who helped you get shout out jason jason we're going to shout out to jason one more time all right so here we go um it's about 728 hey remember 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 hashtag palm Oz magazine Click like and share this to your timeline. Tell your friends about it. Subscribe to Palm Boss. It's a great magazine, even if I do say so myself. And uh, fantastic information. It's helped coach these guys where they are. And they're smart guys. And they figured out a lot of this stuff on their own because it's making more sense to them. They get it. Let's see. Uh, Bob Emmett, Kelly Duffy. I love Kelly Duffy. His humor is dry. He says, Bob, imitate the bird call so I can hear it clearly. <laughs> Is that close? How close is That's that? Close. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're glad you guys joined us. And when the fish truck gets here and gets set up, hey, man, we're going to 
check back in and uh, so you guys can see what's going on. So adios to you guys. Thanks again for checking in. And we will see you guys here in probably another 30 minutes or so.